Okay, Andreas, I'd say anytime you're ready, you can get started. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, well, let's, let's get going. So hello, everyone, to uh, today's um, Astronomy Colloquium. Um, it's a pleasure to have uh, Casey Papovic here today. Um, Casey did his uh, PhD, uh, finished his PhD in 2002 at the Johns Hopkins University. He was working with Mark Dickinson and uh, Colin Norman. And the uh, uh, title of his thesis was uh, The Nature of Stellar Content of Galaxies in a Distant Universe. I guess in 2002, Distant Universe was not, it's not that distant anymore. Um, and uh, he then became a, a postdoctoral research associate and later a NASA Spitzer Prize um, postdoc fellow at the University of Arizona, where he was working with George Masurike, who are uh, very famous for, also for JWST, as you probably know. Um, and then finally in 2008, um, he became an assistant professor and later a full professor at uh, Texas A&M University. Um, uh, Casey, as we see from the talk, um, Casey's uh, research is very, very broad um, from uh, observational cosmology to uh, uh, formation and growth of galaxies um, and also researching the uh, large scale structure. Um, and he uses pretty much any, any telescope that's available to study his galaxies. Um, and he's also a project scientist of uh, GMAX, which is the uh, primary wide field uh, spectrographs on the on the future GMT. And yeah, uh, we are very glad to have him today and we are looking forward to your talk, Casey. Oh, well, thank you, Andreas, and thanks uh, for everyone for the invitation to be there. Um, I was hoping to be in person, but as we know, the hope is sometimes hard to uh, to to plan, make adequate plans during the pandemic. Um, but that was a wonderful introduction. Uh, I appreciate that very much. I also want to thank everyone I had a chance to talk with today. I had many great conversations hearing about science and what people are working on. There's quite a bit of activity up there. Um, and I hope later this semester to have the chance to come up and visit um, to do that. So today, what I actually want to do is highlight some of the science that we've been involved with, particularly the younger researchers that you see here, they're highlighted in bold. We've been doing a lot of work with the Hubble Space Telescope using this slitless spectroscopy mode, really in the infrared that Hubble has to dissect galaxies and to understand their formation mechanisms, uh, their quenching, and many of the physics that go on involving their star formation. My original goal was to take that and move all the way into the capabilities of James Webb, as well as future capabilities from telescopes like the Roman Space Telescope. And I may be over ambitious in that. And so depending on how far we get, I'll be happy to spend as much time talking about that as we have. So if people have additional questions for me or if they'd like to pick up wherever this talk ends, I'd be happy to talk more about both the James Webb Space Telescope, its spectroscopic capabilities, Roman, et cetera. Um, so, but I just know that, you know, in order to highlight all the great science that people are doing, it'll be hard to get through um, all the possible topics that I have in the amount of time we have out of respect for all of us. Okay. So what I wanna jump into is lead with some motivating questions and then what we're trying to do to address those, I won't say we're solving them, but we're trying to make some progress in our understanding of the formation area of galaxies, really. So it's funny, Andreas in his introduction said, yes, my dissertation was on the nature of distant galaxies. And I remember as a graduate student attending a conference where I was speaking in a session called The First Galaxies, and the topic was the redshift of three. The field has since moved on quite literally in redshift space now. We think that epoch of first galaxies is pushing well into the epoch of reionization beyond redshift of seven. But here I'm going to focus most of the motivating questions on the peak period of star formation in galaxies, say between redshifts of one and three. And so the questions we're trying to, to, to pursue in here is understanding why and what drives this star formation within galaxies, particularly during this period. What are the physical conditions within the star forming gas, both the stellar populations and the gas then from which they form within these galaxies? And how is that different than and the current epoch of, our, of, of the universe in which we live? We also know that during this period, redshift one to three, that galaxies begin to quench. And we see many of them that have quenched and it looks like they've formed their stars and finished their star formation at even earlier epochs than redshift one to three. 
in some cases, many billions of years or billion years prior to Redshift 1 to 3. And I would like to go into some of the details, clues we're getting about what drives that process. To look at these questions, I'm going to focus on data acquired from the Hubble Space Telescope primarily, which is taken in the slitless mode uh, using spectroscopy where there is no slit mask. There's no, there's no fiber you're putting on top of the galaxy. Rather, what we're doing is taking slitless imaging of the field of view from the Hubble Space Telescope and using that to extract spectral information from that. I'll give some more examples about that in the next slide. The survey is called CLEAR. The acronym and little graphic is up at the top. So I'll be happy to take a look at that. Oh, I just realized there's something in the chat. Oh, OK, thanks, Andreas, I'm making sure I'm aware of things. OK. Um, so it's clear. You'll hear much more about that as we go along. So but to highlight one of the advantages we gain from slitless spectroscopy, particularly in space, is all the things you see listed down here. First of all, we, can we receive and maintain the high angular resolution from this Hubble Space Telescope and frankly any space telescope that we have, but particularly Hubble, which allows us to achieve, you know, tenth of an arc second resolution, uh, which gets down to order of a kiloparsec or so within these galaxies. So we can achieve spectroscopic information on that scale, which allows us to do some spatial reconstruction of what's going on in terms of ionized gas and stellar populations in some cases. Being above the Earth's atmosphere has great advantages to anyone who's ever tried to observe in the infrared from the ground. There are no night skylines. There's no changes in the atmospheric opacity. The background is very stable or relatively stable compared to the, uh, the daily cycle of the Earth. We don't have to deal with airplanes, Starlink satellites. I was recently in Tucson where I was aghast at the number of Starlink satellites. Oh, I just realized this is on YouTube. So hopefully nobody involved in the Starlink satellites will be mad at me for saying that. And the other nice advantage that we gain from going to space is that the flux calibration of the spectra are very stable and it's exquisite and allows us to put spectroscopic measurements of galaxies on the same footing that we have from, say, space-based photometry. And that turns out to be an advantage when we're trying to, to, to discern what's going on with the fluxes and stellar populations of, them, of these objects. Okay. So as I mentioned, CLEAR is the survey which we're using. It was an earlier cycle, um, uh, 24, I forget, this program with Hubble, a large program, where the intention was to drive deep with the G102 GRISM with the WIPC3 infrared camera on the Hubble Space Telescope. The two fields you see here, the one on the left are the Goods North field and the one on the left are Goods South. These are among the two deepest pointings from the Candles survey, if you're familiar with that, but it's one of the deep extra lack surveys. The GRISM provides slitless spectroscopy at relatively low resolution, RF 200, covering uh, the, the, the wavelength range really of the Y band and through the J band um, of you know, traditional infrared windows. But it's contiguous, it's continuous. There's no, there's no sky opacity blocking any of the regions of, those, of that wavelength range. We combine this, it's very, rather deep, it's 12 orbits per pointing in these six pointings in each of those fields. So we have a deepish survey. And we can combine that with coverage taken previously by the 3DHST survey covering G141 slitless spectroscopy, which provides slightly lower spectral resolution, but extending the wavelength range all the way through the H band, if you're familiar with the infrared windows there. What, and I'm surprised how often I get this question, so I want to spend some time on it, which is what is a GRISM and what does it really gain you? And so this nice graphic was used for a blog post by a colleague of mine, Ben Wiener at the University of Arizona where he describes it really nicely, and I thought it would just be helpful to make sure everyone's on the same page with this. So the idea, as you're all familiar with the telescope, is you have incoming light, which we then scatter spectroscopically with a diffraction grating. And so the blue light gets scattered more than the red light. And then on the back of that grating, we paste a prism so that we can flatten out the spectrum. So the bluer light and red light gets bent back into the path. And of course, then we have the imager here, which allows us to measure this information. And so we see an image of the galaxy with the blue light scattered in one direction and the red light scattered in another direction. It's an efficient way to get spectroscopic information for the galaxy, and then we can just image it very nicely. There's no slit involved in this. So what happens then is the following. If you have a direct image like this, which would be, say, red here is the stellar populations of the galaxy, and blue is, say, an emission line property, let's call it a, the spiral arms of a poorly drawn spiral disk. 
when you take this image and push it through the grism here, the whole image becomes smeared where the blue light is on one end, the red light gets shifted to the other. You'll see the stellar continuum with all its bumps and wiggles and spectroscopic information. And then you get smeared images of the H beta, O3, any other emission features within the galaxy. And so you'll see throughout this talk, I'll show some images like this and you'll be able to begin to see the forest with trees. Um, well, or if you begin to see the matrix of the information encoded within it. And so this is a nice illustration of this process from the, one of the early 3D HST papers by Gabe Brammer, where Hubble normally would see an image like this. This is taken with the WIPC3, the F140W filter, so sort of a JH imaging filter, where people see many images like this as a field taken from Hubble. And when you replace that imaging optic with the grism, all those objects get smeared. And so what you're seeing on this side is actually zero order light and then scattered first order light from the grism, an image of every single galaxy smeared out across the field. Most people when they first see this think it's a mess. And, and frankly, some of it is. It requires a lot of processing to then re-extract all the information. That information can be modeled and then extracted. And we do it the following. Because Hubble's so stable, we can make a model for every single galaxy based on the morphological information and its position within the image. We can model both the zero order light as well as the spectroscopic light from it. And this is an iterative process when we actually do the more sophisticated data reduction that we've learned to do over the last 10 years. We then can subtract in this example, these models for the stellar continuum from all of the spectral traces in the actual data and what we're left with then is an image that would, in this case, show the zero order light, which we don't use, but it's just there to illustrate contamination, as well as emission features. So we see some spatial information for emission features associated with each one of these objects in the image. And so everything is smeared together. You'll note there's a lot of contamination through here. You have spectra that collide with each other. Part of this modeling process through iteration we're able to model each of these independently and then subtract them off to produce very nice flux calibrated spectra as, as the end product. One of the reasons, if you look back at these green fields, which is where we pointed with Hubble, we have then three different position angles from the Hubble Space Telescope. And partly that is because that provides three different dispersion directions for the spectra and gives us different ways to actually then recombine the data because the dispersion direction is always in the same direction relative to the detector. And so this is an illustration from a paper from my former graduate student, Vince Estrada Carpenter, where we have the dispersion in one direction, where one galaxy of interest is at the center of each of these, and we have three different orientation angles against which we observe it. In each case, the dispersion goes in the direction shown by this arrow, and you'll see there's a nearby adjacent galaxy to it. But because in the first case, when we disperse the light, the light from this object and this object com are completely on top of each other. And that's illustrated here. In the second case, we tilted by 20 degrees. And so now we see the galaxy light of interest dispersing this direction with this, the companion going in that direction. And you can see them separated in the second orientation angle. In the third one, we've oriented more. In this case, we've, we've, we've rotated by another 30 degrees. And now the light from this companion is actually well up here at the top of the page. But this allows us to model them separately. We can make a model for the contaminating spectrum, subtract it off from, from the original the galaxy of interest in each case, and that provides a continuum subtracted spectrum. And of course, we can do this for everything and even retain the spectrum, the, the spatial information. And so then some of the science I'm going to focus on is really the following, which is using the data covering these wavelength ranges to probe galaxy stellar populations and also the, the emission properties of the gas associated with them in the redshift range, sort of one to two primarily. And you'll see me focus on that. But on the left is just showing that these are model stellar population models for galaxies, or in this case, a more quiescent galaxy. This is the well-known 4,000 angstrom break with the calcium HK marked, as well as some of the other bands, H beta, and then particularly things like magnesium B where we've shown at different redshifts where these data would be sensitive to those features. And we're able to receive them even in these sort of model data. And I'll show some more results of that later on in the talk. On the right, I'm showing what we gain by looking at both the G102 data and the G141. This is showing the emission properties associated with oxygen two 
H beta, O3, these are real data now from the combined data that run from observed wavelengths of 0.85 up to 1.7 microns or so. And we get all this information extracted from every single galaxy that falls within our fields. And then we can use that for science. Yes, the resolution is lower, but this is still valuable information when you're trying to look at diagnostics of star formation, say from the H, the Balmer emission lines, or ionization from O3, O2, or metallicity constraints. All of that becomes things we can then study. And so I'm going to use in this talk and highlight some work uh, either we've published already as a collaboration or that is near near publication readiness. It'll be out in the next month or so. And really focus on these questions, which is how do galaxies grow? How does star formation proceed? And they'll focus primarily on work by Jasleen Matharu. And then I'll talk also about how, what are the physical conditions within these galaxies and how we use these kinds of data to divine that information. What can we learn from that in turn also both from say how, how chemical evolution proceeds and feedback processes within galaxies. I will, I hope have time to talk about how galaxies quench. And what I'd ultimately like to do is come back and talk about, isn't this a Lyman alpha experiment? And the answer is yes. And if I have time, I'll focus on this, but I wanna really highlight some of this work because we've made major gains here. Um, there's also time here. There's also very interesting work here that I talked with several of you about today. And if I don't have time for it, I'll provide the archive number and I'll be happy to talk to more people about it at the end. Okay, the first we're gonna talk about how star formation proceeds in galaxies. This is an illustration from Erica Nelson using data from 3D HST where she illustrates how you get spatial information on the emission line properties of galaxies from GRISM data. So one of the disadvantages she had is she only had a single position angle. So she was limited a little bit by the spatial information. She had mostly one dimensional spatial information. So in this case, we have the spectrum from the GRISM, but then in the Y direction on the plot, we have spatial information at the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope. The top plot shows the raw data, this is showing contamination from nearby objects and then the stellar continuum model that would be associated with the continuity here and if you subtract these two components from the data you're left with an emission line map in this case that's h alpha and you get spatially resolved information of the galaxy really it's h alpha that's been smeared and so you're seeing that wavelength information preserved on this map um, shown in the bottom pane. from that erica was able to measure both the sizes and H alpha light of galaxies, in this case, a redshift of one, as in she could bin them up as a function of their stellar mass. And so in this case, we have the high mass galaxies are on the left. Or excuse me, I get left and right mixed up a lot. I get the high mass galaxies are on the right, the low mass galaxies are on the left. And this is the, this is the characteristic size of the emission associated with them. She's binned up the data into four bins of stellar mass. In all cases, the H alpha light was always greater than larger than the stellar light, which she and her team interpreted as saying that galaxies are growing from the inside out, that star formation is preferentially occurring in the outer regions of disks. So we've wanted to look at this question with our own data set, primarily because we have deeper data covering H alpha of multiple position angles. This is one illustration. This is a ACS V-band image taken from the Hubble Space Telescope of one galaxy in our sample with a very prominent sort of spiral feature here. And for this particular galaxy, it happened to fall in an overlap region where we have five different position angles, all of which give us slightly different information spatially about what's going on with the H alpha mission. We can then process these data by applying contamination and modeling the stellar continuum as an iterative process, and then work backwards to deduce where the H alpha mission is coming from spatially within this galaxy. and allows us to make an image that looks something like this. We're here, this is the actual direct image at the same wavelength we're processing it with the GRISM. So in this case, it's the Y-band imaging from Hubble. And you can see characteristic bulge with spiral arms in this case. This is a galaxy at redshift 0.55 or so. And then on the right is the H alpha map that is associated with it. So it's taking all the spatial information for H alpha in, this, in these individual GRISM images and reconstructing where they come from spatially. This is work by Jessie Matharu, as I mentioned before, but I wanna make sure she gets credit for this. She's done this for many of the galaxies on a sample comprising more of a hundred objects within our, our data set that she can do this. These are just some illustrations of this process where she has galaxies of their, their continuum image, direct imaging from Hubble, and then their reconstructed H alpha imaging taken from, those, from the GRISM data. Where in many cases you see very prominent features, individual star forming regions, and then the 
in some cases, you can see the spiral arms are well, nicely traced out by the H alpha light associated with them. These, this is sort of a, a, a you know, some of the, the best of the best kind of processes here. Many of them look more like this, where they're very circular, have nice elliptical isophotes, um, very compact in their, this, in their light distribution, both in H alpha and their solar continuum. Nevertheless, Jesse has been working with these to understand similarly where the H alpha is relative to the stellar continuum. And so this is an illustration of that. The bottom plot is showing the ratio of the H alpha characteristic size associated with that relative to the continuum. This is the stellar light as a function of the stellar mass. She, we now have multiple redshift bins, so we can begin to get some handle on how this is proceeding as a function of cosmic time where if the galaxies are on this one-to-one -one ratio, then their H alpha light distribution is equal to their stellar continuum light distribution and their, their sizes. If they're below it, then they would have H alpha that's more compact. And if they're larger, the H alpha would be more extended. That's the key to this whole plot. The data points are bin to help guide the eye. These fits are actually to individual objects. And so we're finding consistent with, with this previous work, that as you increase in mass, the sizes of H alpha are also, are also ex being more extended, which would imply that there's more H alpha growing outside of disks. This is on here, both measurements from HST. The light blue is actually from KMOS 3D. So it's a ground-based uh, IFU survey. So it's taken slightly differently with different selection functions. And that's why it looks a little, this is a running medium. One of the things Jasleen did to try to interpret this was come up with a clever way to reimagine these sizes. And the idea is the following that when we model the sizes, typically there is a strong degeneracy between the assumed surface brightness profile, in this case, it's the CERSIC index for pundits in the room, and the effective radii, and they're related with each other. But she's using a different method that instead of focusing on those effective sizes, she's going to look at the emission within a fixed radius. In this case, I'm gonna show you results for a fixed radius of one kiloparsec, where you integrate up the light associated with H alpha, and you integrate up the light associated with this, this stellar continuum out to one kiloparsec. And we use this measurement called sigma one, which is really the, the circularized measurement of that. And so it's the light within one kiloparsec divided by that surface area. And so what we can see is the following, we apply this. Now what we're seeing is a split. So if H alpha is extended, we expect it to sit down here. And if it's compact, we expect it to sit up here. And this is because we're really reimagining things. This is the surface brightness of H alpha within one kiloparsec divided by the surface brightness of the stellar continuum within one kiloparsec. And so things are compact. You would expect H alpha to be high compared to the stellar continuum, and they should sit in this region of the plot. And if they're more extended, they would sit down below the line. And I'm just labeled where the redshift 0.5, these are our results from clear compared to 3D HST and compared to the ground-based measurements of 1.7. And we're seeing a very similar trend between all data sets when we do this. And so this is nice, it is a tribute to Jasleen, that we've removed the degeneracy in the surface brightness measurements. This is more of an integrated measure of the light out to one kiloparsec and gives us a better sense that's less subject to systematics. And so I like that. But what it's telling us is that there's a very similar trend between this measurement and the stellar mass, but they're offset in mass. And so something is evolving between these two. And that's something we're trying to understand. One clue comes from the following, which is when now if I plot these separate and I show the sigma one here, this is the light within one kiloparsec for the stellar continuum. And then I also show it for H alpha. And I'm showing the red line here is the measurements of redshift one, and the purple here is the are the measurements of redshift 0.5. What we find is that most of the evolution is occurring in the H alpha measurement, not in the stellar light. So in other words, sigma one as a function of stellar mass is very robust or slowly changing between redshift epoch, but H alpha is changing more. And so this seems to be a clue about what's happening. So what I would su summarize this section of the talk by saying the following, that between redshift 0.5 and 1.5, we see robust evidence that there's inside out growth within galaxies where galaxies star formation is more associated with the extended isophotes within galaxies. And this is consistent across the redshift range in which we've looked. One of the hints about what's happening though, is we do see this offset and that the evolution in H alpha, their sizes decline with redshift more so than the stellar continuum. And so we believe this is telling us something about the following, that galaxies are overall quenching, their gas consumption is, is, is either, the gas has been consumed on a faster timescale or we're just seeing an overall cessation of gas accretion 
from the field. And so overall galaxies are beginning to die, just their, their star formations begin to peter out, more of a whimper than a bang, for example. Be happy to talk more about that later. We'll refer you to the paper by Jesslyn. Okay, next section of the talk, I wanna talk about how we use these emission line properties and emission lines as diagnostics of what's going on in the physical conditions within galaxies. These are some snapshots of galaxies within our data set, all in the redshift range one to two. The left-hand images show some RGB composites showing the, uh, the V-band light, the Z-band light, and the H-band light, just so you have some semblance of the rest frame U up to the rest frame B-band in all these cases for the different galaxies. And then the spectra are showing the grism spectra for these objects. And they're oriented in stellar mass. So we have the highest mass galaxy here, and we have the lowest mass galaxy here going from left to left, top to bottom, left to right, if you want to think about it that way. And they show a myriad of properties. We see things that are very small emission features, but remember the, the resolution here depends on the size of the galaxy. So larger galaxies, their light will be more smeared as a result. Their resolution depends on the size of the galaxy. There's no slit on here to help you achieve the resolution you want, for example. More compact galaxies will have sharper lines in many cases, especially if the emission is more compact within the galaxy. In those cases, we see very strong ionization from O3, O2, for example, compared to star forming diagnostics by H alpha, H beta. One of the things we've been able to do then is begin to quantify the amount of flux within these lines and look at some characteristic line ratios. This is a very useful diagram. Uh, many people in the literature have used it, showing the on the x-axis the ratio of the O2 plus O3 emission features. Most of the ionized gas from oxygen is in one of these two phases. This is a very good measurement of the total amount of oxygen within the galaxy or within the, the, star, the, the nebular region here. H beta then is the you know, normalization, but it's also a very characteristic, strong Balmer emission recombination. And so this ratio is telling you something about the abundance of oxygen within the galaxy, modulo with many other effects that I'll talk about in a second. The y-axis is showing the ratio of the O3 to O2 lines, and it primarily traces the ionization state of the gas, in particular something called the ionization parameter that I'll talk more about in a second. On the plot, the contours show Sloan galaxies, so these are redshift point one or so, and the data points show 100 or so galaxies that we have in our data set uh, from which we have decent enough measurements to make this kind of analysis. They follow mostly the high ionization end of this distribution. That's an easy one to see. We can compare that to photoionization models, and we've been doing this now, using updated models from Lisa Culey and collaborators. These are mappings. So they have all the new, uh, the latest ionization within them from stellar populations, as well as updated uh, uh, um, abundance libraries and line transition libraries. They also provide models as a function of ionization parameters. So this is showing here, it's the relative number, the, some funny units here, but it's a relative number of Ion, hydrogen ionizing photons relative to the density of hydrogen within the nebula. And so as you go up logarithmically, that's changing. And that's moving primarily in the direction of higher O3, O2 line ratios. Over here, we have different metallicities listed and they primarily move in the grid along vertical lines as you go from low R23 up to higher R23, but it famously turns over. And so it's kind of folded back over on itself. That's one of the things we'll see. And we can see these models overall match the data very well Although there is a tail of objects with high R23, you know, a fixed O2, O32, that where models have a hard time reproducing some of the line ratios. And I may have a time to talk about that later. Other people have seen this as well. But what we can do then is use these photoionization models, compare them to the line fluxes we have for galaxies, and make some constraints on both the ionization parameter and the metallicity. And so we've been working on that. Here are these galaxies again from the from the uh, poster child poster children I showed previously, and what we've done is taken their line emission line measurements, pushed them through analysis compared to the photoionization models, and that provides them constraints both on the metallicity, and the ionization parameter. So high ionization, low ionization, high metallicity, low ionization, low metallicity. Excuse me. And solar metallicity is around 8.7 on this diagram. So. They've been oriented here as a function of stellar mass from low mass galaxies to high mass galaxies. So you can begin to see some trends in here. Uh, the, this is a probability distribution functions. And we're just showing the most likely regions statistically taken from these. 
what you'll find is that as you move from high mass to low mass, things change, such as the metallicity. And that's been well documented before. This is the well-known mass metallicity relation, although there's no prior on here that they must adhere to that. And so we're just seeing the overall likelihood move in that direction. Well, on the other side, we see that the ionization is changing very much, going from high mass galaxies to low mass galaxies. The former, the high mass galaxies, have lower ionization than the high mass galaxies, excuse me, than the low mass galaxies. They're anti -correlated. These are just five examples, but this shows up for the whole population. This is now showing the ionization parameter on the y-axis as a function of the stellar mass. The contours, again, correspond to Sloan. So this is the low redshift measurement around redshift point one or so. And then the, the black line here is a median measurement fit to the Sloan distribution. The blue and the red show our samples taken for these higher redshift galaxies, both a, a split into two redshift bins. One's a moderately redshift red bin, say, of 1.3. And then we have another bin of redshift 1.8. And we see they're greatly offset compared to the Sloan distribution. Some people have argued this could be a selection effect. I would argue this is not. And if you want to talk to me later about that, I can, well, by plan, I can convince you that that's the case. And so what we're seeing here is evidence that in the past, of higher redshift, that at fixed mass, galaxies have higher ionization than they do today. So this is one of the strong conclusions that we've seen coming from both our data set and other papers. And I'll point to you to buy some um, previous, some other studies in the literature that found similar results. One of the trends, and I don't have too much time to talk about this, but uh, so I'll briefly go through it, that we're very interested in, is when you isolate galaxies, there's still a range of ionization, even at fixed mass and fixed metallicity. And when we isolate those and look really hard at them, we see there remains a trend, an additional parameter between the ionization state, in this case illustrated by the O3-O2 ratio, and the strength of H beta, in this case it's the equivalent of it. They track each other. We've tried to make this trend go away through a variety of checks with selection effects, and we can't. It also shows up if you look more specifically in terms of the ionization parameter itself, we still see this correlation. And so it's something we're trying to understand. I won't have enough time to go into all the details, but you're happy to ask me offline or off the record about what I think it means. Overall, just to summarize this part, we see strong evolution in the ionization parameter. We also find strong correlations between the ionization parameter and the H beta equivalent width, which we interpret as evidence of correlation between ionization and the specific star formation rate. There are theoretical reasons behind this. The one we favor is that there is a trend, underlying trend between galaxies having higher gas densities leading toward higher ionization, as this is also tracked by the higher, having higher specific star formation rates. It's either higher gas densities and or an increase in the escape fraction of hydrogen ionizing photons. Both of those would have to track as a function of ionization and specific star formation rate. One of the reasons we're really interested in this is it has implications for what we expect to see by observations from, say, James Webb Space Telescope when we move to even higher redshifts, where there is evidence that galaxies have both higher ionization and higher specific star formation rates. And so we think this is telling us something about the underlying physics going on with the gas and the uh, hydrogen, the, the escape fraction of ionized, hydrogen ionizing photons. Okay. Okay, I want to spend a little bit of time on this because I think it's really exciting. Because we have the spatial information associated with galaxies, we're able to begin to see where the metals are within the nebula associated with, uh, with star formation. This has been done nearby with surveys like Manga. Here's a nice paper by Mingozi et al. from 2020, where they just show nice metallicity maps measured from a resolved IFU spectroscopy of nearby galaxies. We can do the same thing with our own galaxies because we have this spatial information built from the emission line maps that we get from Hubble using the slow spectroscopy. Here are two examples from a very nice paper published by my collaborator Raymond Simons, who put it together in the following way. They're showing two examples. Both are at a redshift range where we can measure oxygen to H beta and O3. Their individual emission line maps are shown up here. There's a little X you might be able to see that just shows where they're centered so you can line up them with the eye. And then the circle here shows the full width half max of Hubble at these redshifts. So you can determine how resolved these sorts of features are and also what the uh, spatial correlation is, you know, it's a blending associated with the, the image quality of the data. When you take these line ratios and begin to massage them to pull out metallicity information, you find that they can correspond to different situations. And the two of them are shown here. One of them is an illustration where we have a high metallicity center with metal poor outskirts shown by this color coding here, high metallicities, low metallicities. And then we have another case where we have um, indications of a metal poor center 
with richer gas, richer metal and rich gas on in the outskirts here. These are just two illustrations. We can actually move this along much better for and look at the population itself. So here is an example, and we're able to do this over a redshift range of 0.6 out to 2.6, where we're measuring the gradient within the metallicity centered on the galaxy. So this measurement here is the change in the metallicity as a function of the change in, in, in the radius. So if units are dex per kiloparsec, if you want to think about it that way. This is going to be shown as a function of mass, where if you lie in this region of the plot, the top part, those galaxies have, are more metal rich in their outer parts. And if you lie in this region of the plot, galaxies are more metal rich in their inner parts. And the reason I have this labeled here is that that's where nearby galaxies from Manga tend to lie. They are more metal rich in their cores and the metallicity seems to drop as you move outward. And that's a characteristic of how metal enrichment has proceeded over a function of time. What we find when we look at higher redshift galaxies is that this is largely not the case. What we see here are many points from the literature, but with clear, we've been able to more than double the sample that are shown here in red. There are error bars. This is you know, still a very difficult measurement. But by and large, the galaxies lie on the top side of this plot. It's not symmetric and when it's not symmetric about the zero line. More importantly, they don't just sit down below the line, which particularly at high masses is where nearby galaxies sit. So what we're finding is that galaxies, particularly at higher redshift, have indications of certainly they show no negative gradients here, indicative of having more rich, metal-rich inner cores. Rather, their metals are very well distributed throughout the galaxy, or if anything, there's some indications that they have so-called inverted gradients, where you have metal diluted cores and metal-rich outskirts. I do want to highlight some work here, especially by Jin Wang and collaborators who did study this problem as well. They had some great examples of these from their lens program looking at galaxies where this is another illustration of a galaxy where they had two position angles and could reconstruct the spatial distribution of the metals, showing a metal depleted core, metal poor core compared to a metal rich outskirts. And they looked at this as indications of accretion where you have cold metal poor gas from the IGM flowing down into the nucleus of the galaxy that has yet to be enriched through processes associated with star formation. That when this, so I'll just mention we find for about 10% of our sample. Okay, what we do find with Raymond's work, this is the same plot, but now we have been this up as a function of cell and mass, and we're comparing it to what people found previously using observations, say, from Manga, a redshift zero. And so right today, galaxies follow sort of this trend where as you go toward higher masses, they show these negative metallicity gradients, which means that their cores have more metals in their outskirts. What we find at higher redshifts, though, is that that's not really the case. Maybe there's some evidence for it at highest stellar masses, but by and large, we don't see these metallicity gradients, or if anything, they're inverted relative to what we see here. If this inversion really holds up against other systematics or future observations confirm that, then it would imply to us that this is, could be an indication of, of accretion of metal poor gas onto these galaxies. They're still accreting gas and forming their stars. And that that gas then has to be readily mixed throughout the galaxy, either through uh, uh, turbulence or metal or outflows the sort of fountain effects. And Raymond, not only is he a good observer, he's also a theorist. He's trying to test this now with some simulations that he's a part of. And I'll refer you to his work in any future work he publishes on the subject. Okay. And that's simply a measure shown here. All right. I want to spend just a couple minutes on this subject, which is the next question we've been able to look into which is when do massive galaxies quench? And what can we say about this? So this is really work from a former student of mine who's now moved off to work with one of the James Webb GTO teams, applying this toward what they can do with James Webb data. And I'm very excited to see where that is. Where it was an early experiment, I think I gave him this project, not knowing if it was could be done, but being an early young graduate student, he didn't know any better and then managed to go and solve the problem in sort of a very impressive way. So we knew we had a large, population of apparently quiescent galaxies between regions of one and two and a half within our data set, both in good to north and good south. And we wanted to see how well we could model the stellar populations of those galaxies using the GRISM data as data as constraints on what's going on within those stellar populations. This is a plot taken from Vince's early work here, it's published in 2019, where it shows the data, the spectrum, this is the rest frame data, but this is GRISM data now shifted to the rest frame for just one galaxy in our sample. That's all the blue points, it's just the GRISM data. 
And you can see the characteristic 4,000 angstrom break, calcium H delta, calcium HK would be here, excuse me. We can see indications of H delta, a blend of G plus H gamma on this side and then H beta here. Vince was able to model this, including the spatial information associated with this galaxy, and fit stellar population models to this data. And then you can begin to see many of these wiggles are real in the data. This is a tribute to the flux calibration and stability of Hubble that we can readily produce all of these wiggles in the data that are giving us information about the nature of the stellar populations. In this particular case, Vince was able to constrain both the metallicity of the stellar populations associated with this galaxy. It you know, has a median of around solar, was extending down maybe to half solar and a little bit above. And then also the light weighted age of the population, which is illustrated over on this side, just giving us an illustration of when did most of the stars in the galaxy form? I'll come back to that statement in a second. This was the subject of Vince's 2019 paper. Vince went on to improve this for the rest of his thesis, where not only did he use the GRISM data, but he's able to fold in all of the photometric measurements we have for this, these, these galaxies. Those are illustrated here. I have three different cases. He's also updated everything using these. They're called non-parametric star formation histories, although they have parameters. So you know, you be the judge of what non-parametric means. But they're certainly more flexible in their ability to model the star formation histories of these galaxies where he's using both the GRISM data as a measurement of the stellar population properties in the rest frame optical region, where so many of these uh, metallicity and uh, age sensitive diagnostics live, as well as photometry to constrain the rest frame ultraviolet and you know, data from say Spitzer to model the rest frame near infrared of these galaxies. And that breaks many of the degeneracies, particularly between dust and age, for example. When he does this, he's able to then model what the star formation histories of these galaxies look like. These are chosen to illustrate three of the different cases we more or less find. Some cases look like, in the era of time, starts with the Big Bang on the right-hand side of these plots, moving to the observed epoch on the left-hand side. So in this case, a galaxy like this shows evidence that it formed its stars very rapidly with a very rapid, oops, excuse me, just as rapid quenching event sometime around 4 billion years in the past from when we're observing it. This is the look back time. And then it's done nothing since then. In the middle plot, we see a galaxy that's formed its stars more or less continuously with maybe recent quenching, but not nearly as sudden as the evidence would suggest in this left-hand galaxy. And then we see other ones like that as well, that they form their stars very uniformly to our some event, maybe 2 billion years in the past, when they begin to decline. And if you stare at these long enough, you can see there are different photometric and spectroscopic features that would correspond to those, those, those points. What Vince then began to do was compare the star formation histories and these diagnostics that we get from them to other properties associated with the galaxies. I will refer you to his paper where he goes through many of the gory details of that process. But one of the ones I'm gonna focus on is the following. It's again, we're gonna to resort to this quantity called sigma one. But in this case, we're gonna use it as a measurement of the compactness, where it is the mass, the integrated mass within one kiloparsec of the galaxy. So we can look to see how much mass is associated within that inner kiloparsec. It's a measurement of the compactness. This is a great illustration from Peter Van Dockum from a paper he published in 2015 that illustrates this for two galaxies with the same total mass. In each case, these galaxies, their images are up here. They have a stellar mass of 10 to the 11.3, so two times 10 to the 11 or so, the solar masses. But this first case is one that has a very dense core, so it has a very, uh, this is a nice illustration how to do things in three dimensions, where it's M sigma one shows that it has a very large stellar mass within one kiloparsec. Whereas if you look at this galaxy, it does not have a core, it's much more extended, there's even evidence of uh, flocking spiral arms, where in this case, the, the mass within one kiloparsec is much lower. And so it's a way to quantify the amount of compactness associated with this. Coming back to what Vince did, he uses this measurement of the stellar mass within one kiloparsec, this is sigma one, it's really stellar mass density because we've normalized by the areas, it's a surface density within one kiloparsec, if you will, and plotted it against what we're gonna define as a formation redshift, which is taking the star formation histories he infers and integrating them to the point where they formed half of their stellar mass. The plot is oriented such that if they formed all their stellar mass at the Big Bang, they would be up at the top. And if they formed all of their stellar mass, or in this case, half of their stellar mass right before we observed them, they'd be at the bottom of the plot. 
What we find is the following, and Vince defined two populations, one called extended, which have low sigma one, and then one called compact, which have high sigma one. If you look close enough, you'll see the symbols change right about here. This is because there are many other plots in the paper where he wants to correlate those. This dotted line is just to guide the eye. And what you'll notice is that there, and if you look at the plot, there are more points in this quadrant of the plot compared to up here, and there are more points in this quadrant of the plot compared to here. And there's an overall trend between these two. And in some levels, these are completely independent because we're using the spectroscopy and photometry to infer the formation redshift from modeling the star formation history compared to simply where is the stellar mass based on the surface brightness profile of the galaxies. They're independent measurements. The color coding here is just the observed redshift in case you're worried there might be some trend in that. In fact, there might be some trend in that. That's one of the things we've been looking at. And this is because this is all the data we have for these. So it's about 100 objects on this plot. If you take your favorite uh, median kernel to smooth this, this is these various lowest kind of descriptors, then you can find a, this is the running median of the distribution showing the same information. So it's a the formation redshift on the y axis and a sigma one on the x axis. There is an overall trend and it's rather strongly significant. We know there are outliers to this population and we spend some time in this paper trying to interpret those. What the argument we're postulating is that something associated with having higher stellar density leads to more rapid formation periods and then faster shutoff, quenching. So these galaxies, if you have a very high density, you would have formed your stars early and then quench early. Whereas more recently formed galaxies can be more extended. Galaxies may sit over here because of merger activity, particularly minor mergers, which can redistribute some of your stellar mass, but leave your star formation history relatively biased toward the stars that formed earlier in the past. And that's something we argue very sternly in the paper, and I'll point you to the paper to understand that effect. This is, can be understood if it requires, simply because to collapse in the early universe, you require a higher density for that gravitational collapse. This is driving us in that direction, but this is some of the best constraints that have come out on this so far. And I'm really convinced it's done just a amazing job with that. Okay, this is summarizing this part of it similarly, just so we can keep up with everything. But in the interest of time, what I want to do is move a little bit on to what comes next. And if you'll indulge me, I'll spend five, less than five minutes talking about this. That's really summarizing what we can do with the Hubble Space Telescope. So what comes next? Well, these slitless spectroscopy capabilities will be around for the coming decades. Both the James Webb Space Telescope have the capability, as well as the Roman Space Telescope, as well as Euclid. So we're going to see a lot of space-based spectroscopy in the near future, and it's a mode that I think will be more and more useful, particularly now that we have the computer modeling to do the complex uh, spectral decomposition of the galaxies, where we can model both their continuum and the effects of contaminants and do that process iteratively, which is going to be important as we go to larger and larger data sets. One of the projects I'm very interested in and very excited about is a Cycle 1 James Webb program to really see how deep can we go? And it was a cycle one project where I don't know if we were just, you know, trying to be, be just go all in if you're a poker player, but we wanted to make the argument that we should do this in cycle one just to see what's there to find out what we don't know. So the image I just showed is an image of the ultra deep field published by um, uh, Garth Illingworth, or is a reprocessed version of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's in the Good South field. Here it is illustrated within this cyan polygon here. And that illustrates one of the deepest pointings we currently have anywhere on the sky. With Hubble, it's the deepest B-band imaging at 0.4 microns or 4,000 angstroms anywhere we have. This map is then showing all of the data that's ever been taken within the Good South field in the wide eye filter with ACS, so it's the F814W. The exposure time scaling is at the bottom in kiloseconds. So, you know, this is around 100 hours of time dumped into when this field, for example. So this is one field. What field is that, you might ask? That's a really great question. That is one of the Hubble ultra deep field parallel pointings. So when they were observing the Hubble ultra deep field with WITC3, ACS was observing over here and produced one of the deepest I-band imaging pointings anywhere on the sky. The limiting magnitude achieves something like 30th magnitude. If you're a James Webb aficionado, you know this is also what James Webb is going to achieve, but at longer wavelength. 
that we made the case to the review panel that we should do these pointings with James Webb in cycle one, just to see what's there. It turns out if you look at the focal plane between Hubble and James Webb, the instruments are well aligned in the sense that if you target the Hubble deep field proper with NEARIS, which is the near infrared camera that also has a slitless spectrograph on it of James Webb, then near cam, the deep infrared imager, I'm sure it needs no introduction, falls on top of this parallel field. You know, it doesn't completely cover it, but you get most of the coverage, at least of one of the bands and half of the other one. And so we just said, we made the argument that by going on the order of 100 hours with James Webb, you really get two programs. One, you get to overlap with the deepest I band data anywhere in the sky with near cam. This is really to probe the deepest reaches of the universe. You know, at some level, we expect to see galaxies at redshifts 10, 11, maybe 12, depending on what their evolution number counts actually are. And so we expect to see them here in cycle one. The other observations will come from NG nearest here, excuse me, which overlaps with the Hubble deep field, the Hubble ultra deep field proper. If you want to write down some of these numbers, I'll leave them here. But one of the advantages of this field is that it has this deepest B-band imaging, which at redshift two corresponds to very low levels of star formation associated with the ultraviolet. Star formation rates approaching 0.1 solar masses per year. These are all sources with measured magnitudes between 29.5 and 29.7. For all of these galaxies with James Webb, we can get slitless spectroscopy ranging all the way from the Y band through the K band, James Webb is so much superior here, where this is a simulation of one of these galaxies with the stellar mass and this expected level of star formation. And so then we'll have the ability to really probe where the ultraviolet star formation is coming from, as well as the H alpha from it. And there's a variety of science that's enabled by here. One, you can look at chemical enrichment for these low star formation rate, low mass systems. One, you can look at how their star formation is occurring and what the time scales associated with the star formation are. All right. With that, I'm gonna summarize the rest of the talk. So I know I covered a lot of ground, that's because there's a lot of science going on using this mode of slitless spectroscopy, primarily from the Hubble Space Telescope. And thank you for indulging me and letting me talk about those modes. Uh, we talked about how star formation is proceeding within galaxies using spatially resolved H alpha measurements. Primarily, I wanna highlight this paper by Jazzy Mathar, that should be coming out very soon in this year. We also talked about how we're using it to constrain ionization, star formation, and their correlations between them as paper I'm hoping to finish now and then I'm on sabbatical. Then we've talked about how we're using re spatially resolved information from those galaxies to understand gas accretion, mixing, feedback, how metallicity enrichment proceeds within galaxies. I also talked about how we're using these data to understand the quenching epochs and formation epochs of high redshift galaxies. And one of the very interesting findings is that those these processes seem to be related with morphology. And that's something I really hope we could follow up with future observations from James Webb. One of the things I feared and happened I would not have time to talk about is how we're actually using these data to constrain the evolution of Lyman alpha emission within these galaxies. I'll be happy to talk to that more offline. I know I'm out of time. So I'm going to stop here, uh, take any questions that are there. Uh, thank you for your attention, your time. Um, and I hope I get to travel up there to see you all personally in three dimensions very soon. So with that, I'll stop and happy to take questions. So thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Casey. That was very interesting. Very nice talk. Thank you. Any questions? Oops, one second. Okay, we have a question from Sing Bang. Oh, yes, happy to. Had a great I conversation guess. with Jing before this talk. Thanks for your talk and uh, mentioning of my work. So um, on the second topic listed here, uh, have, have you guys obtained, tried to obtain a spatial a map of ionization uh, as well as the metallicity? Uh, another question of mine is, uh, uh, I, I got this uh, question quite a lot and would like to uh, ask you for some insight on, which is uh, the app. Uh, uh, the, the applicability of uh, strong line diagnostics to sub regions of galaxies. You know, usually the strong line calibrations are made uh, treating galaxies um, as a whole uh, based on the integrated measurements. Uh, and you showed us the, uh, the 
comparison between measured line ratios O32 and R23 versus uh, models, model predictions by mapping potentization models. And there are some regions of observational data point that cannot be reproduced by mappings. Like if you guys manage to get a spatial map of ionization, uh, does that make some predictions that in such areas of galaxies where uh, the values of ionization and malicity are not actually reproduced by models? And have you uh, considered any implications on that? I think that's a great, no, thank you, Jim. That's a great question. And uh, I'll probably work a little bit backwards through that. Um, you're one of the experts on this as well. So whenever I say something wrong, I'll appreciate you jumping in to say that. I, I think you're right. So there are cases where the models we're using are unable to produce, particularly it's those high R23 ratios. So something is going on inside the data. Now, I agree we're constrained by the current photoionization models that we're using to make those constraints. So we need to capture a lot of that through that lens. Um, one thing I'll say is that many of the arguments that you're saying between, well, so one, I, we, uh, that's actually something we're looking at now, right? these ionization maps. I'd love to talk to you more about how we're going to do that offline. I think ionization is something we can constrain better than we can maybe even the metallicities, simply because the correlation between O3, O2 is so strong. And so if we have those, then we have a very strong uh, uh, measurement of the ionization. So that's one, um, one thing I'm more confident in than maybe the metallicities where you know, we are dependent on some of these strong line calibrators. Regarding the strong line calibrators, one advantage, as you probably are aware of, at high redshift, I know you know, at high redshift is that the galaxies as a whole are much more involved in star formation than, say, nearby galaxies where you have a lot more of this component, this diffuse emission component that could be corrupting some of the integrated emissions. Right. So I don't know if that's a good answer to your question, but at least if you know we're processing things associated with star formation using those models, they're giving us good measurements. I also take some heart that when we compare, say, our mass metallicity relation to other people's, that they match up pretty well. Um, so I think there are some systematics, but I'm hopeful that at least that the the relative strength of the trends is legitimate. If that makes sense, right? I don't know if I answered your question. Does that get through? Those? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. I, yeah. Thanks. It's Thanks. a great it's a great problem. I also think we ought to be moving toward more different photo ionization models, perhaps with harder ionizing sources, as well as adjusting the relative abundances of the of elements within the, the gas that we're using. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that when we have measurements, say, from James Webb with additional emission lines, maybe some of those weaker lines, they'll be able to make those statements more quantifiable. We'll be able to do that work. Um, so I'm going to say that's something for the future. How about that? Sure. Thanks. You no, know, it's a really great question. That's why my answer was so long. So, yeah. Then we have uh, another question by Lee Armas. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hi, Casey. Hey, Lee. Good to see you, at least on a tiny screen again. Uh, a lot of the talk, um, well, because of where we are and the exciting launch that we just had, is focused on going super deep. But I'd also like to get your thoughts about um, how we might extend some of the science that you were talking about by going wide, because that's what we're going to get with Roman. Um, and, you know, we, we have the potential to go super deep, but really what we're going to gain is just this breadth of spatial coverage. So um, that opens up a whole new area that you could relate to some of the stuff that you and your students have been doing. So I'm wondering if you've been thinking about that a little bit. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, under I understand completely. And clearly, no pun intended, clearly James Webb is more on my mind just because, oh, my God, we could be getting some data and that's exciting and also terrifying at the same time. Um, whereas but I have thought about Roman. In fact, I'd love to talk with you all. And I had some good conversations today about that because you're right. Here, you know, we're using samples of maybe 100 galaxies and then we're trying to tease them apart into different bins and massage them in a way so we can see underlying correlations. And I think we finally, with Hubble, you know, with hundreds of hours of observations, have the ability to make some of those statements like all the work you're seeing here. As you pointed out correctly, you know, a, a, a hundred hours with HST is something like it's a factor of 200 going to Roman just in the the field of view alone and so sample sizes will just explode in that area and so I think at that point these these statistics will will 
that's the number one thing we'll get. We'll just have enormous fields covered with this kinds of data, which we can then enable this whole kinds of modeling. Um, and all have, the in, and all the environmental effects, which I think you, know, you are really interested in right. as well. I know very much so. In fact, I was talking to Xin Wang earlier today. He has a program looking at specifically a couple clusters targeting with these kinds of data. But there, when we have Roman, we'll be able to actually map those regions straight into the filaments, out into you know the void maybe. Um, where we can then see what those environmental effects are within the same data set. I think that would be really exciting because we'd be more protected against systematics at that point. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited about that area. Yeah, thanks, Casey. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's where I see this going. So, yeah. Thanks, Lee. So we have another question from Takahira. Hello, Casey. Um, sorry, it's hit an hour, and if you don't mind answering oh. my question. Sure. Yeah, so my question is also about a uh, metallicity gradient that you show in the second part of your talk. Um, I'm wondering, because you show um, cell population analysis in the, um, the next part, uh, quenched galaxy. So I'm wondering to interpret the observed metallicity gradient, um, have you thought about using quenched galaxies more specifically you know, the metallicity map in quenched galaxies. And it can be something done with HST resolution, but I'm not sure. So I just want to uh, hear what you think. No, that's an, that's an excellent question. I think the answer is yes. I, I, I do hope we can do that. One of the annoying things about the current quiescent galaxies is most of them are extremely compact. And so we just don't have that spatial information associated with them, or at least once you're out into the lower surface brightness areas of them, we. I'm not confident we have the ability to actually tease out what the metallicity constraints are there from the stellar continuum modeling. Um, although that's something we've thought about trying and we have tried a couple of times, we just can't convince it's gonna give us that information. I would say, unfortunately, at least with these data, I'm not confident we can do it yet, but I think we should try. The stellar, the, 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 the constraints we can get on metallicity require the, the, the full one dimensional spectra. So we need the, that B sub signal to noise. But there are some cases where we see extended quiescent galaxies where we're trying to actually extract the spectra both in the inner part and then a, a lower surface brightness part to make comparisons between the two. So we could see, at least as a function of radius with some underlying simplifications, if there are differences in that in the that st stellar populations. I'm hopeful that that might show us some evidence of differences in features that are associated with alpha elements, you know, magnesium or something, compared to iron-based elements or iron peak elements like iron itself. And so then we might be able to say something. There have been some work done with this using integrated spectra from MOS fire, and I think this is something that's wide open and to be explored. So maybe the answer is no, we haven't done that, but I think it's a really exciting idea. That's great. Thank you, Casey, and thanks for doing this. Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay, then we have uh... One, one probably love one last question by Nick. And Casey, um, real quick, I'm, I'm trying to understand the rationale for your sigma one parameter. So how is that chosen? I'm wondering, I mean, it seems like you're trying to differentiate between flux and mass in the extended regions of the galaxy versus the center. I'm just trying to see how is one kiloparsec chosen? I mean, there's various different ways you can go about measuring surface density. Is this, um, I'm wondering if you're neglecting anything by that choice or if there's... No. Yeah, yeah. great question. Um, so you're, you're right, it is a sort of an arbitrary choice. So we've looked at several ways. I'll, I'll, I'll try to get back to, the, to answer the question ultimately. What the issue we were having is, and many people who've tried to model surface brightness profiles, maybe yourself also know, is when you're measuring the effective radius, it's very dependent on the choice of that profile. So the effective right. radius depends on the surface brightness, the surface profile. And so the choice here was to say, okay, we want to use a measure that is actually instead of not modeling those independently, but is an integral of that. And so then it doesn't really matter what you've chosen because the integral is always going to give you the same answer. Um, we, so we, we've adopted, that's really the, the, the precipice, the, the, um, uh, um, uh, the, the motivation to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so then we, Jasleen, to her credit, has actually looked at several different choices. She's used the effective radius as one choice. As you integrate out to the effective radius, you know, it gives you roughly half the light, for example, or she stops at one kiloparsec. One reason she's focused, she, and actually in her paper, she uses both. Uh, it's just not available yet. 
and so the trend is strongest with sigma one. And so we're interpreting that as, okay, the core versus the disc has the most signal within it, but we see all the same trend when we use the effective radius. I think the yeah. answer is an arbitrary choice, but we see the same thing when we use a different radius as well. Um, right, I'm assuming they're all correlated. Partly it's motivated by one kiloparsec because other people have used that as well in the literature. Um, mm -hmm. Sandy Faber and many of her uh, collaborators up from Santa Cruz have tried to use the same thing. So we were trying to use something that people would at least recognize in the literature. Um, maybe right, and you, and yeah. you get a high surface brightness region there too. You so. get a high surface brightness region. That's, that's exactly correct. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, yeah, thanks. Good question, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now read it the last question and then we, we wrap this up. I have to ask one. Um, we, we have looked at this, uh, the trend between ionization parameter and H alpha or H beta equivalent width. And even after marginalizing the star formation history and metallicity and stellar mass and all those things, there is, it's not enough to just have, to, to account for, that, for those parameters and you need something else. and our explanation 10 years ago was we need to change the IMF to do that. Um, I know this is, uh, you may not like that. I'm looking um, for the unsubscribe <laughs> button, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, no, continue. You're right, you're absolutely right, yeah. Uh, because otherwise, you know, why is the ionization parameter changing? It's, it's not just gas density, something fundamental has to change in the properties of stars. I completely agree with you, Ranga. Um, will you remind, like, send me like an email about that? Because I'd love to know that interpretation. We've been scouring some literature and I must have, you know, um, I'd love to hear more about that. Because yes, there's a section in the paper where we actually say, oh, IMF, and, you know, but we kind of throw our hands up in the air and, you know, all think you're right. Because once we start playing with the IMF, it could be anything. I would be, so I, I haven't focused on that as much because the only evidence, as you say, is that there is a higher, there's a correlation between H beta equivalent width and the ionization parameter. And the IMF absolutely could do that. I would be the first who's really excited if that's the case. Um, so I think there must be other diagnostics that we need, you know, be it helium two or something, or, you know, it's exactly what we said, helium two. Neon five, you know, um, but neon, yeah, neon five would be reachable. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have more high ionization probes uh, to really get at that question, to see what the underlying ionizing population needs to be. Um, I think it's a great question. Yeah. And I was only kidding. Thank you. That's a really good point. We'll discuss it later. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's, that's it for today. Thank you, Casey, again for this wonderful talk. Um, thank you, nice to, thank you, everybody. to have you here. Great discussion and uh, thank you for all the questions and discussion yeah and like i said thank you all um i really enjoyed my time today talking to everybody so thank you yeah thanks casey you got to make sure to come out at some point when that's allowed i, I know I'm, exactly i'm planning on it so yeah yeah great okay thank bye Thanks, Andreas. I mean, I need to run to my meeting with Yoon, so I'll go do that. So sounds good. Yeah. Oh, there's still Phil. I saw your email. I, I was in meetings, as you probably uh, figured out. Meetings through, so whenever it's convenient, yeah. don't worry about right. it. And right. Right. Something you got to get another. Yeah, but it was great to see you. Um, and yeah. so I'm, I'm on.